we'll wait to see if any attendees pop in. Mm -hmm. All right, you're good to go. Have a nice meeting, everyone. Have a nice day. Yeah. 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 Have a happy Thank day. <laughs> Bye. Bye. It's looking like we might not have anyone watching. Oh, yes. Let's get it done. <laughs> <laughs> Move to approve everything. Votes <laughs> <laughs> today. <laughs> oh, we're being. I second so that. <laughs> so, um, it is. It is. Seeing that we have a, I'm. I'm going to start now. Seeing that we have a quorum of the community, pre <laughs> community resources committee. Too many things going on in my mind. Um, I'm calling the June 16th, 2020 regular meeting of the community resources committee to order at 2:05 p.m. Um, Governor's Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, MGL chapter 30A section 20, allows us to hold this virtual meeting of the Community Resources Committee. This meeting is being recorded for future broadcast and all votes will be by roll call. At uh, this time I will call upon each committee member by name so that we can confirm that each of us can hear everyone. Uh, please remember to mute your mic after saying present. Shalini Balmill. Yes. Mandy Jo Haneke is president, present. Hmm. Evan Ross. <laughs> yeah, it gives a little peek to some ambitions there. <laughs> I'm present. Dr. Ford, call your office. <laughs> Too late of a meeting yesterday, apparently. Um, and Steve Schreiber. <laughs> the public doesn't show up and we go crazy. Um, I'm here. And Sarah has just texted me that she cut her finger trying to make a sandwich and she will be joining us momentarily as she cleans herself up. <laughs> um, so we will, we will um, go through some other things as she gets on, but we will expect her soon and acknowledge her when she arrives. Um, there is no chat room for the meeting. If you have technical difficulties, please contact me, committee members, and we will work on figuring out how to correct that if that happens. Um, for the members of the public, we are going to soon move into public comment. Um, actually, I think we are going to do that now. Let me look at my agenda. Um, yes, we are going to move into public comment now. So if there are any members of the public who wish to express their views uh, and make a public comment, they have three minutes to do so. Um, and we will not engage in dialogue or comment on a matter raised during this this public comment period. To participate in public comment, if you joined through the internet, please click the raise hand button. If you joined by the telephone, please, please press star nine on your phone. Um, and I will, if there's anyone that wishes to make public comment, we'll recognize them in turn and we'll work on unmuting and muting as appropriate. Um, there are currently no attendees as far as I can see. So we do not have public comment, um, so I'm not going to wait to see if zero attendees raise any of their hands. Um, if attendees happen to join at a later time and reserve the chair's right to come back to public comment just in case they were not right on time today. Um, at this time, we will move to presentation and discussion items and the noise bylaw is up first. And let me pull up the noise bylaw and I'm going to share this with everyone um, so that we all are looking at the same document. So this should be shared now. This is our current noise bylaw. There is at least one thing on the second page. Penalties are on the second page. This was referred to us um, specifically for item A4, which was from me but also for um, noise issues in general and um, potentially noise issues related to gunshots, particularly as it applies to the gun range down in South Amherst. Um, the packet included some history on potential revisions to this relating to the gun um, issue in South Amherst. Um, and beyond that, I am going to come up with, we're going to work our way through um, the CRC process for evaluating these. Um, I will mention as we work our way through that this referral was for um, 
was was for a report and recommendation and we had 90 days technically to do that um given that i i will say i don't even know what is going on here um are you still seeing the noise bylaw okay <laughs> my screen just looked like it might have shared something else and um, the first thing we always want to do is clarify the ident and clear clearly identify the purpose of our review. And right now it is for specific recommendations on that item A4, but also for items potentially to the whole noise bylaw, including the issues that particularly um, District 2 have counselors have been seeing in their district regarding just general party noise in the neighborhoods and how this is or is not enforceable. I want to take the time right now to say that Sarah Schwartz has just joined us. When her audio is up and running, please just indicate you can hear everyone, Sarah. I should be able to, can you hear me? I can hear you. We can. Welcome, okay. Sarah, and we hope your finger's okay. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have moved into noise bylaw, and right now we are just identifying the purpose of our review, which I believe on the referral is, um, report and recommendation. So that could include modifications to the bylaw itself, rec recommending modifications or not. Uh, it, does anyone else have anything they'd like to say regarding what the purpose of our review is? I am not seeing any, so we will move on. Um, the next question under that purpose review is whether we can get responsible candidates and or should we recommend an interim action if we can't or just that recommendation would be let us continue review. Any thoughts on that? I am not seeing any. I will state that we can probably finish in 90 days and if not, it's not so urgent that we would need an interim action. It's my thoughts there. Um, seeing that no one else was indicating they might want an interim action, I will assume that that is um, sort of everyone else. Next up is identification of stakeholders. Um, and, and this is the part where I thought we'd spend our time here. The, I, I'm not sure does the actual bylaw itself in terms of its substantive changes at this time. Um, I suspect we may want to talk to people that have to enforce the bylaw. And I did not arrange that today um, because I wanted to hear from the committee who we might want to talk to. So, um, Evan. So I don't, I don't know where I don't, if this doesn't fit here, you can tell me to hold my comments later, but having served on the bylaw review committee, I wanted to just provide a little bit of background context about some of the discussion that occurred on that committee around this bylaw. And I can hold that because that's not really stakeholders, but it might inform that. This is the perfect time because the st it's stakeholders information needed and prior recommendations. So it falls under the prior recommendations and conversations so that we get a background of what's been done and what's not been. So perfect time, Evan. So, so I want to zoom out a little bit because that's actually um, where bylaw review committee started when we looked at this um, and to talk about noise bylaws a little bit more generally and how different communities implement them. Because um, I think that that might be useful to thinking about any recommendations and revisions and, and um, also is going to be part of my defense of number four. Um, so um, essentially, for those of you who aren't familiar with this, and I was not until this bylaw review discussion, there's essentially three types of noise bylaws or ordinances that, that range from complete discretion to police to much more rigid and standardized. And so on this end of the, the coin, you have ones that are decibel based. And a lot of communities have these, they're decibel based. And they say a noise is unlawful if it is above this decibel. Um, and obviously the decibel threshold varies by district or neighborhood, you know, higher decibel for commercial, lower for residential, but it's, it's decibel based. And so there's an actual number um, and this requires police departments to have decibel readers. 
and require some training of police departments because they actually, when they get a call for a noise bylaw, they go to that site, they take out their decibel reader and they see, does it exceed that decibel limit? And if it does, it's unlawful. And if it doesn't, it's not. So it's, it's very similar like if you get pulled over for a speeding ticket, right? They have a radar gun and they say you, the speed limit is 75 and you are going 80. It's the same concept. It requires um, equipment and training though. Then there's what they call the, um, the uh, audible standard, which is in the middle, which is you define a noise as unlawful if it's audible within a certain distance. And so a police officer gets a call, they go to that site, they have to stand say 50 feet away and they say, can I hear this noise at 50 feet away? And if I can, then it's unlawful. Um, obviously there's a little, there's some numerical specificity there with distance and it, it varies, you know, commercial, maybe it's a hundred feet, rural, residential, maybe it's 50 feet. Um, but there's also some discretion because, you know, maybe a, different people hear different things, right? And so maybe one officer would be able to hear it at 50 feet, maybe it wouldn't. And then on this side of the equation is what we have, which is what's called the nuisance standard, which is basically complete police discretion. The police go to the call and they just determine, is this a nuisance? This is what we have. And in, in when the bylaw review committee, the previous version, not the version that Alyssa and Pat and I served on, talked to the police, they brought up, you know, do you like having a nuisance standard as opposed to an audible standard or a decimal standard? And the police said, yes, we like it because it's, it's easiest for us, right? We don't need any equipment. We don't need to buy decibel readers. We don't need to train people. We don't need to have a conversation of what constitutes audible. It's just use your best judgment. There was, so that the police department likes that. There was some discomfort on the committee itself with the nuisance thing because who determines that something's a nuisance, right? And, and it's really open to interpretation. So um, I made the point as I will always make that I, I lived in a neighborhood where two houses down was a student rental and two houses down was grandparents. And on the same days, I often had the students blaring rap music and the grandparents' grandkids yelling and screaming and that high pitched child scream. And to me, because I enjoyed the music, that wasn't a nuisance, but the screaming children was 100% a nuisance, right? But the students got the cops called on them all the time and the children wouldn't, right? Because no officer is going to show up and respond to ch children and declare that a nuisance, even if with like a decibel gun, it might be just as loud, right? Um, so it, it, it introduces a lot of discretion. And so I wanted to give this context because if we're looking at the noise bylaw, I think we have to understand that the way we do things is one of three ways. Um, and there are other ways to do things. And there are benefits in that it's the easiest and cheapest method for the police department to implement. There's also downsides. And so one of the members of bylaw review, and I'm, I won't name her, but I'm sure you can guess who, was worried that if you instill all of the discretion in the police, then of course there's potential for racial bias, right? Maybe it's a nuisance if it's rap music that's being played loud, but not a nuisance if it's country music that's being played loud. So when you input all the discretion to police, you know, there's something there as opposed to it has to be above this decibel. Um, Bylaw Review Committee talked about this. We said police like how this works. It works well for them. They like this. So we're just going to make some minor changes. But I did want to introduce to this committee, since it's before us, that there was a discussion about all of these different approaches. And it's also worth recognizing that not every community has one, right? East Hampton, I think, doesn't have a noise bylaw at all. Um, Northampton only has one for vehicles. It only applies if, if the noise is emanating from a vehicle. Um, so there's lots of different ways to do this. Obviously, as a college community, this is something that I think the community wants. Um, so anyways, I just wanted to give that backdrop because there was a, a very lengthy discussion in bylaw review committee about this that did consult with um, our law enforcement professionals. Sarah, and thank you, Evan, for that. Yeah, thank you, Evan. And I'm gonna, so I have wondered about this many times living on a street that's me and my family. And then until we get all the way to the end of Meadow Street, 
it's all student rentals, right? We have townhouse, we have, um, we have a rental that's about maybe 70 feet away from us and there's just a huge parking lot. And so I try to cut people slack because I was young, right? This is mostly a, a, you know, student rentals and, but when I'm sitting awake still at like 1.30 in the morning or 2 a.m. and it is so loud that I literally can hear entire conversations or like a mob screaming from just laying in my bed even with my window closed like sometimes i feel like a crank like just a cranky old woman calling the police like i think this party's too loud but then i thought if there was a way to measure the sound literally i think that people would be registering on if they would be the decibels would be very high, perhaps even more surprisingly high than if we call that old lady calls the police and says this party's really loud. You think, well, it's an old lady. She's gonna think any party's really loud. But like literally sometimes it is, it's like a leaf blower loud 70 feet away from you. So I wondered about having something that actually um, is measurable. And in some ways that it would, I think it would make things a, easier when you're trying to decide whether or not you should call the police. So maybe that's not relevant. The other thing is, is that in the age of COVID, um, so now everybody honks for everything, right? It's somebody's birthday and you can't go to their party. And so there's a sign in front of their house that says honk because it's Dave's birthday. Um, but then frequently in the summer, there are signs that partiers will hold up that say, you honk, we drink. <laughs> And I literally, and it sounds funny, except if you're <laughs> close to a house and they have that sign up for four or five hours, which sometimes happens here. Um, and so I don't know what I'm trying to say is that I guess it's sometimes it's not totally cut and dry. Like Evan says, sometimes I wish that we could actually have something that measures how loud um, a noise actually is. That sounds very rambling. Steve. So just uh, one anecdote. So I just had a Zoom reunion, 40th Zoom reunion of 14 people that I lived with in an off-campus house when I was in college. And one of them said, do you remember Mrs. So-and-so? She would call the cops every night at 9.55 in anticipation that we were going to be noisy at 10. So they had a 10 o'clock noise bug. But um, in the world of construction, there was a thing called the prescriptive spec specification versus a performance specification. So prescriptive is kind of what Evan was describing about decibels and so forth that, or, or speed limits. Performance is based on that it's not, um, it's, it's a different form of measurement, measurement. So basically a nuisance is a nuisance if I say it is, or a reasonable person considers it to be a nuisance rather than something that's 15 or something like that. So the, my, my uh, having lived in communities that had a prescriptive measurement for noise, the problem is that if there is something a nuisance, it, this has already been said, but if there is something that a nuisance, but it doesn't show up on the decibel meter, then there's no remedy. So if it's performance-based, then there is a remedy. Um, and I completely understand, to me it's like a problem, this isn't, I've never had a problem with this particular bylaw and we live right in the midst of a lot of student rentals in sort of tight lots but so i i wouldn't be an advocate for changing this but um i can definitely see what the issues are with uh, like the type of music live music versus like if it's live music versus um recorded music does that make a difference so Anyway, I, I, I'm okay with the bylaw the way it is. So I, I wanna say before we get really into discussing potential changes to the bylaw or not, I wanna know, you know, I wanna work through whether we actually want to talk to particularly the police department again. Um, it sounds like bylaw review did an extensive discussion with them. Are we content with what we've heard from Evan on the previous work that they've done in speaking with town staff um, or would we want to bring them in again to be able to ask our own questions and all um, would be a, 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 an answer I would want to know for obviously scheduling purposes. Thoughts from the committee members? 
Shalini. I think Evan provided a really good uh, review of this. So thank you, Evan. And as far as at least the police is concerned, I think we, we know where they stand on it. And there's so much going on and to take away the staff time to come and repeat the same things feels like a waste of their time. Then I was thinking also that, do we want to get a sense of how many calls they get related to noise? Is that important? But then from what I'm hearing Sarah say is that even though it's noisy, many people may not be calling the cops, so it won't be an accurate reflection of how big a problem this is. So I'm leaning towards not involving the police anyways. Sarah? Yeah, I would say that I respect the work of the previous committee, so I don't feel like I would need to have the, to have the police come in again. If I don't hear any other objections to that position, that is what we will operate under. Um, it, it sounds like Evan's in support of that position of, of moving on without trying to bring the police in. Um, so I will make a note of that. Are there any other you know, we call them stakeholders, but any other sort of groups or interests or individuals or town staff that we can think of or town committees that we can think of that we may want to um, ask for their thoughts, whether that's bring them in or if we have specific questions for them, you know, Shalini was mentioning something about number of calls or something that could potentially be answered by an email. If there's anything like that, we should get that out now if we know of it so that we can work on getting that information back or scheduling someone to come in if we want someone to come in. So if anyone has any other people or, come, you know, like groups or anything or staff members they think we should talk to, uh, raise your hand and let us know. Shalini. I'm sorry I didn't read up enough about the background about this bylaw. So if someone can tell me like what, how this came about, like were there stakeholders who talked about this? Like why, I mean, did someone push for this change or, and, I mean, are there already people who have a problem with noise and what are their concerns? So I'm the one that actually brought this when the recodification of the bylaws came through. Um, section A4 about lawnmowers and snowblowers was an addition to the previous bylaw. And my beef was it, with it was not necessarily that it was added, um, but that it was seeming to be added, that it was a substantive change that was being included in a wholesale revision of the bylaws that people may not know. Um, so I was the one that was pushing for the council to at least talk specifically about that addition and to whether what that does to the bylaw, um, whether it's needed, what's its purpose and all of that. So, so that, that's sort of the background. And then it got referred to GOL when every future bylaw for consideration got referred to GOL and GOL said, this really isn't what we should be discussing. It's more of a substantive matter. And so it shifted off to CRC. So that's the background of why it's there. But while it was in GOL, some GOL members brought up things about other issues in potential noise bylaw issues. District 2 is having, there's a couple neighborhoods in District 2 where their constituents have really had issues with noise, um, and particular some sort of party noise, um, large gathering noise. Um, and so that was sort of added into this referral. Um, while you're looking at it, look at that. And then um, another GOL member also brought up the, the prior issue back in spring of 2018 where a petition article was filed to amend. There was not specifics, and this is where I just linked to stuff. Um, they, they brought a petition article to amend the noise bylaw to prohibit like gun firing or something, but they didn't have actual language for what that amendment would be. And buried in a KP law uh, memo about whether town meetings should even act on that, because that was the town meeting after the charter was adopted. Um, so buried inside that KP law memo was an indication that whether or not the noise bylaw changed to prohibit sort of, you know, noises related to gunfire after certain times, say, you know, I think their proposal was something like five or six at night, 
September, you know, May to November or something, say, um, that KP Law's memo came through and said, because that gun range already exists in town, under state law, they're grandfathered into their current operations. So changing the bylaw would have no effect on that particular gun range and that particular noise issue in South Amherst. Um, so that information is included in there because a counselor at GOL said, well, while you've got the noise bylaw, maybe you should look at that too um, and make a determination on that one. So that's sort of the three things we have here in the history. Um, you know, I, I see Evan's hand. So I will pass to Evan for comment or question. Right, so, so I mean, this all gets at what we're trying to do. Um, if we're looking at this in terms of uh, A4, I don't actually think we need to talk to any stakeholders, which sounds bad, but it's just file a review, talk to law enforcement, and that sort of, I mean, the other stakeholders would be the entire Amherst community, um, we, which we could do. But um, if we're looking at the gun range, you know, there are a number of stakeholders, but my, my interpretation, not interpretation, my reading of the uh, opinion was the same as yours, which is it, this wouldn't actually affect that. So um, I feel like we're, it's not, personally, I feel like it's not worth our time to even debate that because we already know that we actually can't solve that problem, it seems. Um, and so if we did want to deal with that, then we'd want to bring in the Norwada Fishing Game Club. We'd want to bring in um, the residents of Applewood who were very supportive of, of that petition. But if we can't do anything, it's not worth it. Um, the, the District 2, the parties, I'm not quite sure what the, I, I don't know, what, what we're supposed to do with that. Um, in, if we are going to, and, and so that lends itself to a broader review of the noise bylaw. And if we were going to do that, there are a lot of stakeholders. And honestly, the ones that we should be reaching out to are both people who live in the neighborhoods that they feel have problems, but also the people who live in the houses that get called on all the time, um, which of course right now probably they aren't there. So. Um, I, I think it really depends on where we want to focus our review. If we're just doing A4, I think we could probably even bank this out today. Um, if we want to do the complaints from District 2, I think that requires a broader review and, and reflection on the, the um, effectiveness of our noise bylaw, which I think is a bigger and a little bit more amorphous effort, but I think also would include bringing in community stakeholders. Great summary, Evan. So let me ask three questions um, and we will potentially go to a consensus on each question. Um, the first one is, given the information we have regarding the gun range um, issue, do we want to tackle that or do we want to say, given the KP law opinion, any modification wouldn't relate to that. And so at this point, we're not going to look into modifications related to that. Um, welcome, Dave. Um, we're in the middle of noise bylaw discussions. And so so that that's my question on that. I will point out, and this much I don't know, if we changed the bylaw, it would not apply to the neurotic gun range. But if, if we changed it to relate to that issue, it would not apply to the neurotic gun range, but it would apply to any gun ranges that might come into town in the future. And so I think a weighing of that possibility as we discuss this question at least should be hanging out there. Um, so thoughts on whether we want to deal with the gun range issue or report back on that one and say the KP law opinion is what it is. And at this time, CRC, I, I, I assume the recommendation would be at this time based on the KP law opinion, CRC recommends not modifying the bylaw regarding that issue. Thoughts? Shalini just gave me a thumbs up with whatever I just said. <laughs> so I think that would be a don't deal with the issue and recommend the town council not modify the bylaw based on the KP law opinion. Any other thoughts on that? Do I get nod heads or thumbs up or I'm getting a lot of nods, nodding, Evan nodded his head. I somehow lost Sarah in the view. I didn't lose Sarah, Sarah lost us. 
Sarah is no longer listed in the panelist section. I will text her. Mandy, can I ask one question? Yeah, sure, Dave. Um, so sorry to be a few minutes late here, just some things kind of built up around town here and we were dealing with them. Um, but under, just under A, the, the introductory paragraph, what, it just seems pretty squishy where it says um, comfort, repose, or the health or safety of others, especially during the hours of 11 to seven. What does that so we yeah. haven't gotten to the substance of the bylaw oh, okay. yet. <laughs> so I'm sure that that's one thing I will be bringing up. We're trying to figure out what the length of our, the breadth of our review is and okay. um, who we need to talk to, if anyone. Okay, sorry uh, to have jumped ahead. No, there. no, no, perfectly reasonable question. Um, so, so Shisera, we lost you for a minute. Where we are is Shalini and Evan are of the opinion um, that we don't want to deal with the gun range issue now. We want to hang our hats on the KP law memo that says if we don't deal with it, well, if, even if we change the bylaw to try and deal with gun range noise, it wouldn't affect the gun range we have in town. So at this point, recommend the town council not modify the bylaw in response to that issue. Yeah, I heard that and I agree with that completely. So consensus is don't deal with that one. We're not going to take a formal vote on that. Um, I will just report a consensus based on KP law bylaw. Opinion, I guess it was. Um, so the second question is, um, I had three. Now, do I remember them? Was um, the, the second one, I guess, is the general review of the bylaw. Do we want to embark on a general review of this bylaw in whole or stick our review, you know, based on D2's concerns about party noise or stick or confine our review to some specific areas that the area of A4 that I actually do believe relates to the prologue of A2, um, of A in general, not A2, um, that I had brought up that originally ended up at GOL before everything came to us. So general review of the noise bylaw or not, Sarah? Sorry. <laughs> so yeah, I would say just to stick with the addition because I think that the whole of the bylaw, I don't think that we necessarily want to get into without, like Evan said, being able to call in all the stakeholders because this has been really very carefully, well, this has been crafted over a really long time. My husband was on the Peace and Quiet Commission back in the, maybe the later, well, maybe early 1990s. Um, and it did, I mean, it did start with party noise and I don't know if we want to really start I think we have to make a conscious decision if we want to get into um, totally redoing it. I would be happy just to stay with the addition, which is four. Other thoughts? Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Shalini gave me a thumbs up again. Evan is giving me a thumbs up. Uh, Steve is giving me a thumbs up. So it seems to me that the consensus is to, um, as to party noise, um, given Evan's report about things and what we've heard and the length of crafting of and history of the bylaw, at this time, we don't want to get into a full rewrite or a full investigation of stuff. Did I summarize that well? Okay. Which leaves us to, uh, the third question was going to be if we wanted to what time frame is that is so so I don't have a third question other than that brings us to the reason I had this referred to GOL um, and really it was the addition of four I was concerned um, and so now we, we will just move into the substantive discussions see if in the next 10 to 15 minutes we can we can resolve it or reach some sort of vote or something um, so I'm just going to take hopefully less than a minute to explain my thing 
Um, lawn mowers, leaf blowers, snow blowers, other similar, similar mechanical devices are very prevalent spring, fall, mainly fall with mainly spring and fall and summer. Winter, not so much. That's more of a discrete time period. Um, and I thought it was really given the wording in the sort of prelude to A, that first paragraph that Dave actually mentioned, the especially during the hours of 11 to 7 doesn't actually say only during the hours of 11 to 7, which means um, leaf blowers that run seven hours a day and in Amherst Woods in the fall, they sometimes run seven hours a day um, with all the landscapers coming through, could technically be found in violation of this bylaw. And I thought we needed to have a substantive discussion as to what extent do we want things like that to actually be able to be called on the, have the cops called on. And I will actually give you a very recent example from the Amherst Woods listserv that is now new. Um, the other day, someone wrote, what can we do about the noise? There's no peace and quiet in our neighborhood. There is constant mowing, mowing, mowing going on. I can't get away from the mechanical sounds because of all the land care, you know, going on. And I will say the first response was buy some noise canceling headphones. Um, and the response to that was, you know, it, it, the response to that was, but shouldn't the noise not exceed your property? You know, like it, it, it was not, but, but it really is constant. And I think people staying at home have, have realized how much noise they create. My other concern with this was some lawn mowers and leaf blowers and snow blowers are louder than others. And I was concerned that the addition of A4 was actually a weird attempt to outlaw, even though it doesn't technically outlaw and, and improve air quality in town by trying to have people called on for using really nasty polluting two stroke engines that are the loudest of all of these devices. Um, and I don't, I, I'm more of if you don't want those types of devices in use in town, you don't put it into a noise bylaw, you just come out and say, we don't want to use two stroke engines in town, and we're gonna ban it or something. And I don't think that was necessarily this, but I, I, I would be more direct if that was really the goal was to reduce people's use of certain really polluting mechanical devices for lawn care. Um, so, so that's why I was there. I'm okay with leaving A4 in if we maybe do something with the intro paragraph. Evan. Right. So, so again, um, providing a little bit of context um, as to the discussion of bylaw review committee um, and why I don't share Mandy's concerns. Um, the first thing I will say is uh, in, in the sort of lengthy discussion that bylaw review committee had about this um, never was the idea of trying to get people to transition to different types of lawn equipment even brought up. I hadn't even thought I, now I'm like, oh, I wish I thought of that, but I like it hadn't even crossed my mind until you literally just said it. So um, while certainly I, this maybe could be misused for that purpose, I can tell you uh, there wasn't a single member of bylaw review committee that raised that um, a, as a possibility. Um, so to give you a little bit of context, and this relates to what I said earlier about how our noise bylaw is all is completely discretion based is that this list could be deleted completely. And actually that was one of the things that um, bylaw review committee considered because what this list does is it doesn't outline the types of noise that are potentially unlawful. It gives examples because what's actually important is that paragraph that, that Dave referenced, which is basically that paragraph under A says we are giving, we are instilling in the police the discretion to determine whether something is excessive, unusually loud, disturbing, or injurious. We never define what any of those words mean, right? We're giving the complete discretion to the police department. And we're saying we especially want them to think about this between the hours of 11 and 7 a.m. That's not saying those are the only hours they can enforce this. It's just saying especially during those hours. But, but really that paragraph defines the structure of the entire bylaw, which is 
we're going to throw out a bunch of words that could be interpreted a bunch of different ways and we're leaving it up to our law enforcement officials to interpret those and apply those. We're giving them complete discretion. So bylaw review committee at one point actually talked about and, and even decided just getting rid of that list altogether because that's all you need is that paragraph. And really um, in, the, in the first part of the new bylaws, we make clear that the words include are, are not meant to be um, exhaustive, right? Include, include as in, it's, it's, it, these are examples. So at one point we had actually said, let's get rid of the list altogether and just say, look, if the police officer determines that it is a nuisance or injurious or excessive, that's all we need to know. And then we said, you know what, for the sake of the public who might be reading this, we might want to give them an idea of some examples of noise. And so in some cases, we just updated things. So for instance, um, we took phonograph out of number one, because those don't seem to be that big of an issue anymore. Um, we got rid of, this was, I'm looking at the original bylaw that we worked with. My favorite one was um, originally we had a, uh, what, what was then four, which is devices to attract attention, whatever that means, right? So in some ways we cleaned it up. And then we said, you know what? This came a lot from, from Bernie Kubiak, who as a town administrator had said that disputes over noise from leaf blowers and lawnmowers often were things that came to him as town administrator. And he said, you know what, this is something that people do get called on. So why don't we put it in there to forecast that this is a noise that people should be mindful of? Because that's really what this list is doing is saying, be mindful of these noises. Now, if a police officer gets called for a leaf blower at 3 p.m. on a Sunday, they're not gonna, my assumption is they're not gonna write up a ticket. They're, they're not gonna take that seriously. And this bylaw doesn't require them to because you could delete that list altogether and the bylaw still stands. Because the most important part is that first paragraph, which says police interpret and apply this. And the examples are almost really for the public. Thank you. Um, Steve. Yeah, so, so number four is one of my favorite subjects and it's in just a little lecture that it's an architectural issue that so we lived in Tampa, Florida, where we almost never heard a lawnmower because everyone had small yards and lots of gardens. So here in Amherst, people tend to fill up their space. They have bigger yards and they need, therefore they have grass and therefore they need lawnmowers and oftentimes lawn services. So it's, it's a, um, in many ways, it's a built environment issue, but that's, so people in my household say that, why don't you have a bylaw that says you could only run your lawnmower at these exact hours so which actually some communities do so that way you don't have lawnmowers going all the time what you're describing in Amherst Woods so and the, the other thing is that these lawn services tend to come in with three people right or two or three people like a little small army so is it better to have three people with with two lawnmowers going in a leaf blower or extend that over a period of time. So my feeling is, it's my personal feeling on it, it's just the sound of a community and it's not, you know, that the, I like the way that it's written. And I think that um, 11 to seven to me seems like, you know, the, the, I, I appreciate the description of why that is. There are just one other story here is that at some point the garbage collection in our area started moving earlier and earlier to as early as 5.30 in the morning. So I had no, this is before I went on town council, I had no idea who to contact regarding that because it's all private companies and it wasn't our company that was doing this. So I wrote to somebody in DPW, Solid Waste, and the next thing I knew, I got a call from the police department. It's like, can you tell us exactly who it is and, you know, blah. They go, the police, why are the police involved in this? This doesn't seem like a, you know, a police issue, but they were very nice and the problem stopped, you know, the, the, the trash company. So that makes it very reluctant for somebody like me to ever make a noise complaint because I don't think it should be a police issue. So I think it's kind of a, I think it's a different kind of an issue. That goes directly to some of the other things we've been talking about. What is police? What is yeah, exactly. Not um, yeah. 
Sarah, you had your hand up and then unraised it. So, so I'm going to say something, but I'm going to word it very carefully because I don't mean it in um, um, a way that would be confrontational in, in any sense. But I think that, so, I think in some ways Evan's right about we could kind of just keep that first paragraph because we're just giving explanations of noise because um, I hear everything that you guys are saying about lawn service, um, but in my neighborhood and probably in my district, we don't see a lot of lawn service. You know, I have a good friend down the street who does something, some stuff by himself, but we, this is so not a problem for us. Um, but when Evan said devices that bring attention, so there are a lot of signs that go up with, with college parties and a lot of them are like, yell if you like, I don't know, peanut butter. And so people will like go by and there'll just be lots of screaming or again, like that you honk and we drink, which is fun for the first three hours and not so fun after the fourth. So I totally and completely understand what you're saying because that would also make me, a, it, it does, it's the constant noise all the time that doesn't stop until, and I think that's where the, probably the 11 until 7 a.m. because I think all human beings, if they're not working night shift, that 11 to seven is kind of like your refresh time and your time to sort of get yourself together for the next day. So any noise that's going to hurt your, um, any part of your well-being, right? Mental, or if, if you, I can't think of a physical reason other than just, just driving you crazy, but any noise is going to do that, whether you live in North Amherst and it's a lot of honking and yelling and singing in rounds, or if it's maybe in Amherst Woods where it's just a constant barrage of mechanical noise, I think that we're basically talking about the same thing. So what I have heard is from some people, there's no, their recommendation would be to not touch it at all. Um, and what I think I just heard from Sarah is they're still concerned that it might, that whatever's written might not be enough for whatever it is, which goes to the bigger argument of should we look at the bigger argument um, instead of just that list. Um, so what do people want how do we want to move forward? Um, I'm, I'm in some sense looking to you, Sarah, since you seem to have some concerns about the, not just the timing, but sort of the implementation, the enforcement of it and, and how to get it to work better for that constant noise, not the one-off noises. Does that make sense? Yeah, so actually, Mindy Joe, I thought in some ways that that's what you were also saying is that it's it's the constant noise that becomes wearing, or am I not hearing you correctly? Certainly for, for the instance I gave of the one neighbor who just sent it, that, that, that was their issue is there is no peace and quiet at all during the day um, because of all the lawn issues. I, I was just concerned we were throwing this in as an additional um, without any talk at all about what that means. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know how good this is, e how well you can even enforce this bylaw. That's the thing is that I'm not sure. I guess I was trying to say that, I guess I was trying to agree with Evan in, in the fact that, you know, we give a lot of examples, but really we're talking about when we talk in that first paragraph, we're really talking about any noise that's going to disturb someone's well-being. Um, so I was just, I guess I was agreeing with Evan is that we could have a, have a huge list, right? Because if we're going to do a huge list, then I want to bring back the devices that call attention because those are the ones that I find really, really horribly annoying. Um, so, so I guess I, I don't know, I guess what I'm saying is, um, I guess keep it the way it is unless we want to, unless we really want to attack this later. And I would say it's when students are back because I would want to include them in this conversation because they are our constituents, right? So we want to respect everyone. Um, so, so I was gonna leave it as the way it is for, for now saying that we, we're all basically talking about the same problem, I think which is continual noise and, and bringing it to the 11 to seven, which is at some point you have to say, people need a rest from noise. Like I can say, 
you know, like Steve said, so it's neighborhood noise. Um, if it's kids partying, if it's, you know, leaf blowers, you think, well, people have to do their thing. And, and you can normally stand that until, and I think the 11 to 7 is just a conventional time when people wind down and try to sleep. I guess that's what I was trying to yeah. say. Uh, Dave, do you have anything to add to this conversation since, since you had some questions about the first paragraph? I think, I think Evan might have alluded to it earlier. I'm just trying to wrap my head around that first paragraph because by adding the word especially, to me, I read that as, you know, you could, you could not be in compliance with this at any time of the day, right? Um, by adding the word especially, it puts emphasis on 11 to seven and it, but it, you know, at three o'clock in the afternoon, if I'm playing, you know, uh, uh, Alexa too loud in my living room and my neighbor doesn't like, you know, um, um, I was trying to be funny and think of some pop music, but I couldn't think of it that quickly. Um, uh, Christina Aguilera, or no, she's old now. Anyway, but you get my drift, then my neighbor could call at three o'clock in the afternoon and say, I'm not in, I'm not in compliance with this bylaw. Um, so, and, and the other point I wanted to make is that in general, when I've heard this referenced, when I've heard noise complaints referenced in Amherst, I do know that 7 a.m. is kind of that magic time. So construction can, should not start before 7 a.m. Steve referenced or, or somebody referenced uh, trash collection is now happening at 5.30 in the morning. We've had a number of noise complaints about trash collection. And what's happened there is when um, one of the local companies got bought out by USA Trucking, USA Trucking is starting earlier and earlier in the morning. So there's been quite a few noise complaints about that starting so early. So I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm kind of struggling a little bit with the wording in that first paragraph, but these are just ramblings of a tire, tired guy on a Tuesday afternoon, I guess. You got a full tired committee too. <laughs> yeah, you all were up late. I, I was listening to your meeting, but I think I left at about 1030 and you kept going, so. I have a question for Evan, um, and then I think we can actually almost make a vote. Um, the issue of constant noise, not this, you know, one, not even like a half an hour of noise or an, a truck going by, or I know one time I walked into a construction site because I was very unhappy with their tailgate banging as they were dropping rocks at five in the morning um, in the building of a uh, athletic field. And I was across the street and I walked in and I said, the next time you will get a police response, not a community response as I walked my kid over to the construction site. Um, but that's like one off sort of discrete noises. Did you guys in uh, bylaw review talk about the types of noises that Sarah's talking about, the ones that go on for hours, the honking for hours, or, or as I was saying, you know, the, the noise in Amherst Woods because the landscaping just moves around, but it's pretty much on, on some weekdays from like 10 a.m. to three or four in the afternoon, um, you know, as the landscaping companies go. Did you guys talk about that and how this bylaw, whether it's written to be able to address those issues too? Yeah, I mean, so I, I'm gonna sound a little bit like a broken record here, but uh, the, the way this bylaw is structured essentially puts all of the responsibility in the police officer to determine whether a, new, a, a noise is excessive, loud, disturbing, or injurious, right? And so we don't, we don't, it doesn't really necessarily differentiate between those. So, and, and, and notice that the first sentence is also to create, assist in creating, continue, or allow to continue, which is real, actually, if you think about it, really broad. So in Sarah's example, right, of, of the, the you honk, we drink, which I was honking, now I feel a little guilty, but, um, <laughs> but, but, you know, in that case, she could call the police and say, this has been going on for three hours, and they, they could go, and if they determine that three hours of causing people to honk, that's, that is sort of assisting creating or, or creating itself noise that is um, 
annoy, certainly it's annoying Sarah, or you could say um, in dangerous but reasonable quiet, they can interpret that to fit that, right? And so I, I think, you know, Dave's confusion was a little bit about this wording is like kind of vague and really broad. And I think that's intentional because it's, it's meant to cast the widest net possible and say to the police, you determine what fits into these categories. And again, th that, that's, that's, a big, that's a big responsibility put on the police department. And there were members of file our review committee that, that were slightly uncomfortable with the fact that we, we give so much discretion to the police to determine what is and what is not injurious or nuisance. But every, everything that I've heard given in his example, I think is covered in that paragraph because if it's, if the police could, could say, this is excessive, this is an injurious to the quiet, this is uh, disrupting the quiet and you are creating or assisting in creating or allowing to continue, you can be held liable. I, that, that, that really gives them a lot of power to apply this in, oh, in and on, honestly, to, for me, any circumstance that's imaginable, even if it's not outlined in that list, which is why, again, we almost debated getting rid of the list because you don't need it. And you could even argue that the list feels as though it defines those as the types of things, when in reality, what Sarah is describing could easily be implemented by this noise bylaw if she called the police and they felt that it was injurious, right? Mm -hmm. Did I answer your question? Yes, Steve. So the you honk, we drink seems like another kind of a problem with the social decorum. So, so weirdly there the noise is actually not happening on the property, it's happening in the public way. But I would assume that there's some kind of a motor vehicle code that you shall not honk, you know, you shall not use your horn except under certain circumstances. So I, I assume that we then get into the motor vehicle code, but to me it seems like a single instance of we honk you drink should be shut down because of the, the decorum issue. But my, uh, just, my daughter, having been on Zoom way too long, said the solution is obviously to have, give everyone a mute button. So if your neighbor's too loud, you just click the mute button and shut them up. Sarah. So I just have to follow up the story with something that I think is actually kind of hysterical, also annoying, but way more hysterical, is that, so that was happening during like, you know, the sort of the end of school, um, college, and COVID was just starting to really, you know, get up and off the ground. And um, so normally at that time of year, anybody that's on my street is very, very tolerant of party noise, right? Because people are happy, you know? And so I actually waited four and a half hours of constant honking, which again, if you're driving by, it's no big. If you're literally at that house, it's terrible if you're not drinking. Um, so maybe I should have started drinking, but in fact, instead I did call the police and I did say, you know, I hate to be, you know, annoying, but this is four and a half hours. So it did stop shortly after that. So I'm assuming that the police were like, hey, you know, maybe just called and said, maybe not, don't do that sign. But what's funny is that ever since that happened, especially as students are coming back, people still come by that house and just randomly honk. So it's still happening. So that's just a random antidote. It's, we still honk. So Am I, this is where I'm going to ask for a formal motion. Um, I think what I'm hearing is a motion to recommend that the council not modify the bylaw. Is, is that the motion I'm hearing? Um, I need someone to actually make that motion if, if that's the motion I'm hearing. Evan? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll, I'll make that motion since I was part of the team that wrote this. <laughs> uh, so I, I move that we recommend the town council not modify uh, general bylaw 3.24 unlawful noise. Do I hear a second? Second. 
Uh, Shalini seconds. Uh, are we ready for a vote? I think so. So we'll go through um, Shalini. Yes. Um, Mandy will be a yes. Um, who's next? Um, Evan. Yes. Steve. Yes. Sarah. Yes. That's a unanimous by roll call. I will add that to the report and I think we just met made a decision that doesn't add an agenda item onto the council agenda. <laughs> so yay for that. <laughs> Moving on to our next um, agenda item. And this is the action item adopting a process for recommending appointments to the town council for the zoning board of appeals and planning board. So as Evan indicated at last night's meeting, the packet for last night's meeting included a big process and huge setting forth not just the process OCA had, but also a whole lot of impl implementation help. Um, I went through it today. Uh, we have two members from OCA here. Um, and then the three of us have not been on OCA. I'm going to bring that process up for now. Um, but actually what I'm going to bring up instead of the process there, what I'm actually going to bring up is a different document. I had Evan send me the Word document um, so that we could easily modify it to CRC's needs. Um, so my plan is to go through this document. You will see right now the modifications except in I think one instance and two comments um, include changing the words outreach appointments and communications or the abbreviation OCA to CRC and Community Resources Committee um, and planning board and, and specifying it's planning board and ZBA not finance. Um, so getting, you know, getting a little more specific on that. I deleted in this one, as you're seeing, the charter reference to the finance committee because that is not within us. So um, I thought we would take this section by section um, as a committee. And I believe this is something that OCA did when they were first doing processes and maybe even this process and sort of, of not necessarily vote, but work towards a consensus on each individual section um, before we vote the whole document. Um, we'll see how far we get today. We have almost an hour um, and I'm hoping we can get through nearly the whole thing or at least reach down to if there's any disagreements on any particular sections, what those are and have some nice conversations. So that's the first page. I don't think we need to have any consensus on the title. Um, so we're going to move to vacancy. Um, and at this time, are there any questions um, regarding vacancy um, at all in terms of requested changes or thoughts or anything that people might want to do? Um, and I noticed we lost the video for Steve and Shalini. And so I'm, I, yeah, Evan. Yeah. Right, so this, uh, this is gonna be a, sort of a weird process for Sarah and I, because we've been through this document um, 433 times. Um, and it's also gonna be a weird process, I think for uh, the members on this committee who aren't part of VOCA, because you don't necessarily, you weren't there for the discussions that led into this. Um, and so one of the things, even though I'm sure you're going to be sick of hearing my voice, um, is I just want to make sure I point out things that maybe you wouldn't have thought about that are significant that were parts of discussion. Um, and, and so the first one I want to make sure we note is that um, even though this seems really standard, uh, the definition of a vacancy is actually something that we discussed as a committee. Um, and especially the word in impending vacancy occurs whenever a member intends to resign or a member's term is expiring, regardless of whether that member may be reappointed. And, and this, is, this is actually an important distinction because this differs um, a little bit, I think, from the way the town manager approaches appointments, which is if there is a member in a seat whose term is expiring and that member wants to be reappointed, 
OCA still treated that seat as if it's a vacancy. And so that person had to go through the process as if that was an open seat. Um, and so that's different in many ways than what the town manager does. He does not uh, interview reappointments. Um, and so for, for example, what's ahead of us, Michael Bertwistle um, is on the board. He is interested in reappointment. Um, even so, OCA treated our planning board appointment process as if we had three vacancies, three seats up for grads, even though there was an incumbent member. And so I wanna make sure people understand that that definition actually has some weight behind it. Um, and was actually a, a decision that OCA made that does differ from what the town manager does. Thank you for that. Um, I, I do wanna point out, I simplified the, sen the very first sentence to just state planning board or ZBA, not multiple member body and then defining it to because those are the only two we have. Um, given what you're seeing here on the screen, are there any members that would request any changes to what is here, including a, in potentially the definition of impending vacancy as as Evan just, you know, clarified what that means in this definition? I am not seeing any, so I am going to move on to the CAF. And in this one, we're just gonna pull up this section. Um, I deleted beyond deleting the reference to the finance committee and fixing the sentence because of that reference. Um, I just deleted the word three bodies, the word three, so it's just the CAF for these bodies is a separate form because it seemed weird to say three or two when, and, and also I just made it even more generic and I just wanted to point that out. Um, any, Anything Sarah or Evan want to say about the history of that? Or I know this one was just sort of discussed in some sense in the council because we modified the CAF form or anything Evan, not Evan, uh, Steve or Shalini might have comments on um, at all before we move on to the next one. Not seeing any. I will move on. If someone is reading up and wants to go back, raise your hand and we can go back um, at this point. So the next is the sufficiency of the applicant pool. Um, beyond the changes of OCA to CRC, I added this phrase in here because um, it, it said OCA shall collect all CAFs submitted over the preceding three years. And I wanted to clarify that I'm not going to collect them for finance committee. I'm going to ignore them if they just indicated an, an interest in finance committee as CRC chair. So that was the whole intention of putting that extra language in. It was not intended to change sort of the, the intent or the application of this other than to specify that I don't have to keep track of people who want to be on finance committee too as chair. Um, so I will page down to the next page too. Um, and then I had a question on one thing. Um, but there were the other changes. I will get to my question. Well, my question was proceed to interviews. Is it is it supposed to be interviews or statement of interests? That that was sort of a basic sort of clarity question. When you determine the sufficiency of the applicant pool in OCA, was that I know because your statements of interest were just added are you saying we can now request the statement of interest or we now interview um, and so I, I had that question of which sort of item should be referenced here so um, the the way I viewed this in Sarah I'm hoping you'll pipe in if, if I'm mis misinterpreting this is there's sort of different stages of where we are in the process and stage one is like recruit, collect, grow the pool, and then stage two is interview the pool. And so everything up until this point three is part of that stage one. Stage two is interviews and then interview questions, selection guidance, and statement of interest, even those are three separate steps, are all part of the interview stage. Mm -hmm. And so the developing the interview questions, the selection guidance, and the SOIs are all sort of triggered when you decide we are ready to go from collecting applicants to interviewing applicants. And so that's why the word interviews is used. Okay, that, that helps me. I, I was just as reading it, I'm like, 
it seems to be missing a step. So that, that's why I had that question. Uh, any other questions, uh, requests for changes um, on this section, which is sufficiency of the applicant pool? Steve. Uh, could you scroll right there? Do we ask, do we ask, what questions do we ask about economics? What? Over here. Do we ask about economics, like household income or salary or? On the CAF? Yeah. Because we ask about race, we ask about gender, we ask about age, but do we ask about household income or? Do we ask rent or own at this point? So, so we do not. Um, and the reason that's in there, even though we don't ask for it, is the idea that this, uh, this process can be used sort of in perpetuity. Um, and I there see. have been discussions, certainly where there were discussions in OCA about trying to capture economic or socioeconomic diversity on the CAF. Um, certainly it used to be on there, whether you rent or own, um, which is obviously perhaps one marker. So our CAF does not currently collect that information. Um, there have been discussions about ways we could modify it to collect that information, but it was never determined what the best way to do was. But the thought was put that in there so if, if the CAF is modified at some point, it, it would capture that. Okay, thank you. The, um, actually, another one would be geographic. So like where you live in town would be another one. But is that just too much? What are people's thoughts on adding geographic to this? And all, we don't say profession either, do we? Or no, occupation or... Lists, what's on it and what's not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, in other words, there's all kinds of diversity. That's where... Right. And I think, I think that um, at least my intention in, in writing this was to try to keep it to what we traditionally think of as protected classes. Yeah. Um, people who might be covered under like a non-discrimination law. Uh, one, one fight that OCA had over and over and over again um, was whether to include diversity of opinions or diversity of perspectives, which was a, which sounds great until you figure out how you could ever try to assess that. And, and so we sort of just said, let's keep it to what we typically think of as diversity in terms of sort of protected classes and non-discrimination. Steve. So can we just say that? Because economics is not protected. Yeah. And um, age is, age, so age, but then we should just say age. So race, color, creed, I forgot what the ones, but we should just keep it to the protected classes then, is my opinion. I think with what Steve's saying, he would be asking to remove the word economic and potentially and then, replace and substituting the word generational for age. Put age in there instead of generational. Do yeah. people have any concerns about doing that? So, I mean, I, I haven't thought about this, so I'm trying to... Sorry. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, other, the other way, if there's a feeling that you do want to change this, um, is it could technically also be tied to the CAF? So if the CAF does, if someone says, you know, I really want socioeconomic diversity on the CAF, and then this should capture that, right? It's not there now, but it, it, it has been in the past and could be again. So this could be tied to um, a diverse applicant as wow. represented on the CAF. You, you, yeah. could, you could delete the second sentence potentially and write the demographic diversity of the applicant pool as represented on the CAF or as indicated on the CAF. So that might be one way to, if there's a feeling in this, in this committee that this needs to be changed, that might be one way to at least keep it tied to the diversity information we're actually collecting. Thoughts? But I, uh, you might consider including the protected, I don't know what the official term is, but including protected classes and other types of diversity.
but it's like the noise by law, right? Like once we start listing things, then we have snowblowers, lawnblowers. Uh, what about electric Do skateboards? I hear a preference for any of the options that have been suggested. One option obviously is to leave it alone. One option is to add sort of that, that clause at the end of the first sentence and delete the second sentence. And the other option is to delete economic and replace generational with age. Sarah. Oh, you're muted. Thank you. So even though right estate does not um, include language, because we couldn't figure it out, as Evan said, about um, economic status, I, I, I would hesitate to just get rid of that. And I don't think I, I would keep it the way it is, because if you say as indicated on the CAF, then we're saying that we want to stand behind the CAF as it is right now. And I think that it's still um, something that maybe we want to, you know, look at or that any committee would want to look at again. And I just, I, I would leave it the way it is. Other thoughts? I saw a slight nod from Evan that might indicate agreement with Sarah. Yeah. And Shalini, what are your thoughts? Um, I agree with Sarah and Evan. Hey, Steve. I was just outvoted, so I'll be quiet. <laughs> Are you okay with, with leaving it the same at this point? Okay, so we will move on. Selection guidance. Um, so I had one question about this in terms of just logistics here, and then I want to bring up something of my own thoughts. Um, and I have to, I can't see. Um, the criteria for a healthy multiple member body. The, the question I had was, should we focus, since we're no longer doing, you know, OCA was looking at three multiple member bodies, two sort of focused on planning um, and land use, and one focused on finances, which have two very different sort of um, issues, including one that didn't have any voting members on it. You weren't opposing the voting members. Now this committee is focused on planning and ZBA. So I was wondering whether as we're looking at one, two, and three, we want to contemplate focusing it more towards the committees that are being appointed now. Um, so planning and ZBA. And specifically, as I was reading number one, and this also goes to term limits number two, um, we have heard from many people that planning board members have a long, long um, sort of get up to speed um, issue um, and that it takes nearly one full term to get up to speed and so seasoned members are almost not considered seasoned until the middle of their second term potentially um, and I didn't know I, I wanted to have a discussion as to whether we wanted to modify these criteria because of the specific bodies we know this committee is now appointing. Steve. Was that a question for me or was it? That is a question for the committee. Yeah. Whether or not we should have an exception for a planning board. Um, well, you had your hand up. Maybe that was a legacy hand. It was a legacy hand, I'm sorry. <laughs> but that's why I called on you. Okay. I saw hand. Um, I, I would actually ask Sarah and Evan what their thoughts are that, or what the history behind, I, I know this was probably one of the more controversial sections or more discussed sections of this process. Um, was there a discussion as it specifically related to planning board and ZBA versus finance? Because I know you guys were trying to make it as generic as possible because you had three different committees you were doing. Um, and I, I just don't know the history of that or what the thoughts were behind number one, specifically as it relates to planning and zoning. So you are correct that this was one of the most controversial sections of the process. It was not a one, it was a three that was the most controversial. Um, which is all carried over from the current appointed committee handbook. Um, one and two actually 
came out of Sarah's recommendation for our first round of planning board and, and ZBA appointments to ground our decisions and what we're looking for in the composition of a body um, outside of just expertise. Um, but there was no feeling that w on the committee that one or two themselves um, were controversial. I, 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 my personal opinion, this is not the opinion of Oka, but of me, is uh, that there is, n even though there is a real difference between finance committee, ZBA, and planning board, they all involve um, very complex and technical subject matter for which there is a learning curve. I mean, certainly zoning has a huge learning curve, um, but I, I, so does, in my opinion, municipal finance. Um, and so uh, even though this was written sort of broadly, I, I don't think it was written broadly to accommodate three separate bodies, because I think they actually, I think all three actually meet all, all of these, um, because even though there's voting versus non-voting and, and, and all of that, um, they all involve pretty complicated subject matter. But I, I think I'd rather have Sarah speak to one to two, because those, those came out of uh, her initial report. Sarah? Yeah, so uh, these are near and dear to me because, um, you know, this was the first time that we went through planning board and ZBA. I was the original designee, right? And so I had to make a lot of decisions um, the way the first process worked. I had to make a lot of decisions that I would then have to defend the rest of town council. And when I sat down to do that, um, I felt like I needed to write out um, it, it, why I picked the people that I did and, and what, what reasoning if you don't have like a list of rules of things that you are looking for in people, um, and also the, I, for me, term limits were important. Um, and also how a body worked together. So it's not just the individual, it's also how the individual works within a healthy multi-member body, which I think even as town counselors, you know, if we were to hand pick people to work with people, um, to make things run smoothly or have the have new ideas um, and still have, you know, we talk all the time about institutional knowledge. So these were for, for me, it was really planning board and ZBA. And I, I mean, it applied to finance, but I feel like this is very important for how the ZBA and the planning board work. Um, term limits were something, um, as Evan said, that's, that was very, very contentious, and I'm not surprised that it's coming back up um, in this uh, committee. One thing that I will say, though, is that you know it, it's generally you know lots of times planning board you know that's saying, well, we you know it takes us a long time. Um, we one of the things that we also discussed is that the town could pay for there is training out there for people who are on planning or or zoning to actually go through a short training that would actually bring them up to speed i think there was also some feeling that um there were enough constituents in amherst that felt like there wasn't enough turnover in these two boards and so i tried to craft this in a way that sh would show um, what you're looking for in an entire committee and why you would keep someone on longer um, or why you should look at someone every single time their term comes up to say, is this person still um, constructive to the group? So this is something that I feel very strongly about and um, I would like to keep this idea with term limits and I fight me. <laughs> it's, I, it's just something I feel strongly about. So, I mean, I, but I'm not surprised that we're taking this up again at all. I'm not surprised. Steve. Yeah, so I don't have a conceptual problem with terms or um, you call it term limits, but in a way it's not exactly limits because it's, again, it's like the noise bylaw that we're giving parameters, but we're not being specific about it. So quite frankly, the only part that I have a problem with is the one about the incumbents. The people in the first term should not expect that there will be a second term. And so I think that they should go for through a full review process 
So this, to me, it sounds like you'll be given preference if, yeah, in fact, it actually says that. I don't think we should say that. I think that you should just assume that you're up for re-election, just like if you're a president, that you're not given preference to being the president just because you happen to be the president. So the, in terms of how long it takes to get up to speed on the planning board, I was on for nine years, no, 10 years. <clears throat> and honestly, I don't feel even after 10 years that I knew enough, but I think that after a year, you should know enough to, you should know 80% of what you need to know. There's staff there, there's training that Sarah was mentioning, there's the other planning board members. So a, a year is about right to go through a full cycle of the types of things that you encounter. But also importantly, in two years or a year and two years, the other planning board members or we as a town council watching the planning board will also have a good sense as to who is working well on the planning board. So in other words, that's also a very important perspective is the ability to uh, be a, an effective planning board member. So in short, the part that I would get rid of is the part that says that you're given preference for a second term. That just but the rest I'm okay with. Sentence? Yeah, that part right there. Or is it the first sentence? Because the conversely doesn't work if you get rid of the first sentence. It would be... No. Um, I think we should just be silent enough. <laughs> After your first term, you're, re you're reviewed. And maybe you'll make it, maybe you won't. Just like, um, I don't think we're given preference. Town councilors aren't given preference for a second term. So... Um, no, I'm just, yeah. Hmm. I, you know, I obviously haven't thought enough about this as much as Evan and Sarah, so I'm really relying on hearing from you all sides of the discussion and pros and cons. But what's just coming up for me is that, you know, our goal is to make the this committee, the planning board, or whatever we're voting for, strong and, and hopefully with the rehire to be stronger. So the end goal is always how to make this committee continue to be strong and stronger. And that should be the criteria. So if someone is new, but not as, you know, I mean, visibly, we will never know, or we have some ideas maybe that based on what we've seen in the past about. So what I'm saying is we don't really, let's say, know 100% whether the new person is going to be better than the existing person, but we do know the, the existing person and how they've been performing. And if we feel that that person has been performing really well and has some expertise, and then given the context of where that situation is or what it is, like I, I feel like we need to give weight to the to the context, the individual person, but and to have a blanket preference that any new person is going to be given preference over the person who's already completed two years is not necessarily going to strengthen. So I want to push back against that, unless fight me <laughs> for <laughs> what, what were the reasons, what were you all thinking, uh, and what was your reasoning to put that in? Evan? So I can I can try to address some of these things. I do, and Sarah's probably experiencing this too, think it's funny because the things that were non-controversial on OCA seem to be the things that are controversial here, and the things that were controversial on OCA seem to be not as controversial. So this, I, my mind is trying to adjust to this weird reality. Um, so, I mean, I, again, A3 is all verbatim from the existing appointed committee handbook. Um, and it's almost funny that we ended up just adopting language that was verbatim from the handbook because we spent probably four hours debating pretty much just A3. I'm not joking. I think it was two full meetings of two hours um, to, to land on sort of what already existed. Um, and the reason we landed on what already existed um, is because the language itself is sort of compromised language in that it, it affords us a great deal of flexibility. And so on OCA, we had some people who said, 
no term limits of any length at all. And some people that said six years and you're gone. And then people going back and forth in between. And what I think we came to with A3 is that the language is soft enough to allow us to do what we think is best. And so, you know, when you say in that first sentence that Steve takes issue with, generally, if a person is surfing a first term, they are giving a preference for a first term. This does not say that we always have to give a preference for a second term. It does not say that we have to reappoint. It says, look, if you served a full term and you showed up and you did your job and you are interested in continuing to serve our community, you have some preference over the other candidates because you've already put some time in. But that's a general statement. If there is someone who did their first term and they have worked hard and done and, and, and really done a good job as a member, of course we want to give them a preference for a second term. But if there is someone who showed up every meeting and just said, I don't like all y'all and was just causing problems every time, well, that, that generally gives us that flexibility to say, we're not going to, generally we would give a preference for a second term, but in this instance, we wouldn't. Same thing if a person is completing a second term and there are other qualified applicants. So that's an important clause right there that I don't want us to gloss over. This isn't saying if someone's completing a second term and there's someone in the pool, we give that someone preference if that person's not qualified. This is if there's someone who completed a second term and someone comes along who possesses everything we're looking for, they have expertise and they fit exactly with the needs of the body are at that time, then we're going to give that someone a preference. But if the newcomer in the pool comes in and they're like, so what's the planning board again? Of course, we're not going to give that person preference because they wouldn't fit that um, qualified applicant. And again, it's just a preference, right? It's not saying we should do so. And the final thing is, although there is no fixed term limit, normally limited. So again, these words are important here. And I feel like I'm teaching my students, right? The, the, the rhetoric, the actual word choice is important here. Normally limited, which is to say, more times than not, we're probably going to say two terms, but there are exceptions. And that next one comes into place where special training or expertise is required. Longer periods of service may be appropriate. All of this language gives enough flexibility that the council can interpret it, I think, to meet what the needs of the body are at that time. And so um, that's the Cliff Notes version of a four hour debate. Um, but, but that is where we kind of came down on that language was it, it permitted the flexibility to allow the council to operate within a number of circumstances. It, it, and what we were really looking for is we had people who sort of wanted one side or this side and this, this sort of uh, didn't have any of that rigidity. So if I mischaracterize, please let me know. Because no, you raised your hand and now it's down. <laughs> You're confusing me, Sarah. I'm sorry. So I think that Evan pretty, I guess I just wanted to strengthen what Evan said, although he explained it beautifully, um, is that is exactly what he said is it, it, it's giving the council a lot of flexibility and still compromising to two sides that felt very strongly about um, no term limits or absolutely term limits, or if you're on for one year, you should automatically be one term, you should automatically be, you know, renewed for another term. So th basically just what this is saying, like Evan said, is that um, this is not, I don't want anybody to feel like this is making your choices smaller. As Evan said, they're expanding them, but still keeping enough of a, a, a gel of an idea that, um, it, it it's holding you to some rules without um, making them very narrow. Um, one of the things um, I'll just I'll leave it there. I think Evan did a good job. So I I have a concern about this. I I've already been through this process once in GOL adopting a modified form of this for finance committee, and and in there I said I don't really like number three but I wasn't going to force its removal, as I think what I said in there, that I could live with it even though I don't like it. We did though 
in GOL delete the, the references to the appointed committee handbook. And I want to bring that up again. Um, the appointed committee handbook is an executive side handbook in a sense. It's not really a council handbook on our council appointed committees. Um, we haven't as a council even adopted it at all. Um, so I, I, I don't like the reference to the handbook itself, even if the language is directly out of it. And I get why you would reference it because the language is directly out of it. I just don't like that because we as a council haven't really adopted that book. Um, and that's also, I think, one of the things I've got concern about this number, even though I'm not going to push for its removal, um, is the council hasn't expressed one way or another its desire for term limits. And so it gives me pause for our committee to put some sort of language in there, even how, and, and the more I hear Evan speak about it and George speak about it and Sarah speak about it, I get how flexible it is. It still gives me pause that a committee is almost adopting what could be a, considered a policy of the council. Um, and I know that brings in awful thoughts to you, Sarah, in terms of what's a policy. Um, in that, and, and, and maybe I'm thinking about this wrong, each person on the council, as Evan alluded to, will have their different view of whether we should have term limits. And so I almost feel like this language is trying to codify too many people's views when that issue is almost something that should be left to any individual counselor to decide for themselves, um, I think is where I stand on that. But I am not going to stand here and fight for four hours on this language. Uh, if this committee is leaning towards keeping it in, I, I'm going to go with that. Um, but I did want to put out my thoughts on that. Shalini. Very convincing arguments. And I still want to, what I'm still not getting is that why are we not basing it on just the qualifications of the people? Just by saying that we're giving a preference to someone who's new is already putting extra, giving extra weight to the person who's new. But if you remove that preference and just see two people for who they are and who's gonna be best for this committee, and base it on that, I think it removes that extra, even though it's meant to be flexible, but language is such that the words we use give extra focus to certain things over other things. So even though your intentions in creating this was flexibility, because you went through four hours of that conversation, so in your mind, you're coming with the pure intention that we want it to be as flexible as possible, and we want to invite new people and not just have stagnant committees, but to the public and everyone else who is watching and participating, it comes across as, without knowing all of that discussion, it comes across as, oh, the preference is to the new person. And so I'm still not convinced why we need to have that. I mean, if you're trying to get new people and recruit new people, we should be doing that. But by inserting this, we're weakening our own. I feel like it's weakening the choices I'm going to make because of that preference I'm going to give to the new person. Sarah, then Steve. Unmute, please, Sarah. Thank you, Mary Jo. So this was, um, this was the committee sort of, you know, we were split on this. Um, and there were people who felt um, one of them is a chair of another committee, that it was completely disrespectful to if someone had served and put their time in on a committee and had shown up and done a good job, that it was completely disrespectful to not give them preference in having a second term because they had already put their time in. Um, it was also a compromise between um, People who said we should, you know, maybe always be looking at, at things to completely shake them up and people who are saying, um, I don't even think you should pay attention to term limits. If somebody's doing a good job, then they just keep coming back and, and back. Um, I, 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 in a lot of ways, agree with you, Shalini, that, that I, 
OCA was split on this. A lot of us said, yeah, no, it should be on the value of the person and how they work with the committee and why would we ever give preference. What I'm going to say to you after hours and hours and hours and hours of discussion is that if we take this out and we bring this to the rest of town council, there will be a very strong part of town council who will then start this argument up again. And then you will be arguing again about why would you be so disrespectful of someone who came in, served their time and did a great job. So um, I just, I think you're opening yourself up for this entire conversation all over again. And I'm sorry if I just sound exhausted about it, but it's, it's so mm -hmm. exhausting and I can just see it all coming back right now. So, but I mean, I, I know what you're saying and I technically, I agree with you. Um, Steve and then Dave. So that discussion at town council doesn't concern me, but I prefer this one where it's still daylight as opposed to, um, I, you know, I really see both sides, but I, I think I, what Shalini said it really beautifully that your second time you're applying, you have that body of knowledge that you can put on your CAF that this is the experience that I'm bringing to this. And so that by itself, is should give you a leg up, but I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm always really concerned about preferences because to me that's almost like a anti-affirmative action kind of a, a coding. So like we give preference to legacies. We give preference, you know, if you've already you know done this or if you've already done that. So you know, there have been very controversial times where people have not been reappointed after one term on the planning board. And, you know, 10 years later, that's still sending shockwaves through everything we do. Um, but that person, in my opinion, that's like not being reelected. That's like being a, serving a, as a president for one term of the United States and then not, you know, not being elected for a second term because there's other better candidates. So, so my preference is to get rid of preference. Dave. Um, I'm kind of wondering whether I should chime in here or not. I, I've not been involved in, in this at all, but just a couple of quick comments. And, and again, I, I don't have a horse in this race, if you will, but um, you know, this is a fascinating conversation and, and I haven't uh, been a part of or, or kind of you know, uh, focused in on on the earlier conversations, but a couple of things that struck me. One is that, um, you know, through the years, if you actually look at who has had the most experience working with committees and boards and their chairs in town, I might argue that it's actually department heads that have the most overlap with, if you think about planning board, ZBA, finance committee, you know, the department head who is staff or, or staff under that department head who is uh, staff to that committee or board actually has seen the seasons of those committees, the ebbs and flows, the ups and downs, the sometimes the good and bad, sometimes, you know, all of those things. So it's interesting. I mean, I, you know, if I had a, a time machine, I, I might suggest maybe talking to department heads about what, what kind of things have worked in the past and what haven't. I will know from my own experience of working with the ZBA, the planning board, uh, and the conservation commission, those regulatory boards, um, you know, there is no substitute for that experience. I, I see the word seasoned. Um, it takes time. I think um, Evan and others alluded to that. It can take a long time to feel comfortable with the zoning bylaw. I don't care if it's Amherst zoning bylaw or anyone in the Commonwealth. It, and it, it getting used to being on a regulatory board where you might tell somebody no, or you might have them adjust their project and it just costs them a tremendous amount of money or time to do that. It, it takes time to feel comfortable in those shoes. So that that's kind of interesting to me. Um, I was also intrigued by criteria under A, criteria for a healthy multi-member body. Um, the, the one word that kind of jumped out at me there was healthy. Um, and, and I wondered, you know, again, I'm not suggesting this, but I, you know, I look at effectiveness too. What does it mean to have an effective multi-member body, a healthy and effective multi-member body? B, 
because we've talked about that so much through the years. As you all were talking, it also made me think about, you know, Amherst, the perception of Amherst as anti-business. And through the years, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had about, uh, about that with uh, business owners and developers. And not all the time, but a fair number of times through my 15 years on, you know, working for the town, it has come down to a board or committee not working effectively together. So that might fall under healthy, if you will, having a good mix of, of um, uh, uh, qualified people and people who are collaborative and get along and are good listeners and all of those things. But um, there are times when it's not, and it's no one thing that results in, I believe it's no one thing that results in that image of Amherst as sometimes being anti-business. But there have been boards through the years that clearly some members um, expressed very strong views that were anti-development anti or anti-progress. Um, so I guess I wanted to focus on knowledge and experience, this critical zoning board, planning board, conservation commission. Um, and training is so key too. I know you all have talked about that, but I think there's an assumption that there's a lot more mentoring that goes on in committees and boards. I have to be honest, I don't see a lot of mentoring. I think what, what we need to do is commit in the future to more training, more cross-training. Um, and we need to encourage boards and committee members to train together and, and either bring training to us or go where the training is. Because I think that's how you're gonna create a healthy multi-member body, whether it's finance committee or, or CONCOM. Um, so anyway, those are my kind of random thoughts all over the map. But um, no, this is, I, I understand why you've grappled with all of these. Uh, I've been through so many changes in boards and committees where, you know, under three, you know, two terms is up and somebody has to leave or maybe they get an extra year, et cetera, et cetera. I will say also, I, I do want to emphasize the importance of the chair people of committees. Um, there, there's no, absolutely no substitute for a chair who can move, particularly the regulatory boards and committees, and that's where I spend most of my time in the last 15 years, but having a chair who can move a meeting forward, can move a process forward, regardless of what the outcome might be, whether the applicant likes it or not, the, the committee or board must move through the regulatory process. In many, many cases, there's, there's a, a there's a um, regulatory, there's a, a statutory reasons they must move through that because they must be done in 30 days or 25 days or whatever. So, um, so anyway, those are my random thoughts, thinking a lot about training, mentoring, what does that really mean? And then lastly, how is it that the, the council evaluates members? When, they're, when a member is done their first term, what is the evaluation that you all use to say they should get another term or not? Who, what, what's the criteria for evaluating somebody? So anyway, you guys have probably covered a lot of that stuff in many, many hours of discussion. So I apologize if that's repetitive. Sarah. Uh, mute. <laughs> Just naturally think everybody can hear me all the time. So. Um, I think it's interesting the things that Dave brought up. So one of the things that I, I want to say is that planning board and zoning boards of appeals are appointed and they are not elected. And if you want them to have the, say, the perks of an elected office, then we should start working on changing the charter. Because if, you, if that's what you want, then that's what it should be. And they're very different they're very different positions, elected versus appointed. And so that's something to really um, to think about. Um, the other is, is that when it came to talking about how long should you be on planning board or zoning board, because it's, it takes so long to learn, these are things that we talked about. And one of the things that I argued very strenuously for was professional training once somebody's on that, that somehow, and I know we have no money right now, right? So blood from a stone, as, as far as the town goes. But I think that if someone has the, the brains to be on and has the, the interest to be on, then they should have professional training. 
because just expecting that you're going to have people who have been on planning or zoning for a long enough time, you know, that can teach or teach effectively or teach com with a completely open mind and heart or have the time to do it. That's, I think that's asking a lot of people. I think it's a more level playing field for all of the people on planning board and zoning board of appeals. If they have had professional training be, you know, provided by the town, you know, they're that we, we say, yep, we think you should do it. Then the town provides them that training and then everybody is on um, a level playing field. And when it comes to how does town council, like why town council, how do we decide? That's something that OCA has grappled with quite a bit. And one of the, the most important things that the designee does is to speak to the chair right away and say, how do you feel your, your border committee is doing? And what are the special things that you're looking for in a person to help balance out your board or committee? Do you, you know, not have someone who is an architect and it looks like all the big projects you're coming up on, you know, you really need a person who has that experience. Then we follow that. So we definitely take into consideration what a chair says. We, we don't think that we know how many times somebody showed up to a meeting or if they've done their homework when we get there. So um, that's, that's something that we do. Um, and then working with what the chair gives us, then we, we have a discussion together about qualifications. Um, so that is something that's, that's, uh, that's taken into account and is healthy as opposed to effective. I use the word healthy um, because for me, it means that um, something that health is healthy is um, working well, uh, running well, also has a great attitude, right? Because you can be effective, but also maybe be um, not bringing in new ideas or people feeling good about each other and able to, you know, even if they have different ideas, be able to work well together. So effective or healthy, I don't think that, I, I, to me, I guess that doesn't really matter. I think that we're sort of getting at the, the same thing. Oh, yeah. Sarah, if I could, and, and I meant, like, I was just thinking healthy and effective. Right, right, because they mean right. basically. Not one or the other. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, um, I, so for the most part, I completely agree with what you're saying, yeah. Well, I want to do a time check. We're four minutes till four. We have some minutes to do. I do see two hands. Um, uh, I'll call on both of them, and then we might just, we will start sort of at B, I have made a note, unless we can agree that B is kind of fine, I've made a note that we might have to come back to the term limit discussion um, and all, but, but let me hear from Shalini and Steve and then I will move on on the agenda and summarize this. Shalini. Oh, I just wanted to say that I personally found uh, what Dave shared was very, very helpful and clarifying. And so some of the things that I heard were, that I like the use of healthy and effective because they do have two very different meanings. And because I can have a healthy body, but if my, but I may not be taking actions and doing things that I should be doing. So I could be healthy and not effective. So I would encourage us considering using the word healthy and effective and that really sets the touch point for us and intention for the committee that it's not about just getting together and being getting along, but we have certain goals and we're going to do that in a open, spacious, healthy way. But our purpose here is for this intention. So I think adding effective is really good. I also heard you talk about the value of experience. And that, again, that makes me think we're putting a person who has experience at a disadvantage by adding that language. So um, that was really helpful in me clarifying that in my head, why I was resisting this. And then um, I like the idea of mentoring a lot. So even if you're not getting the trainings, but if there's a way to mentor, um, and that's all for now. Thank you. Thank you, I really appreciate that. Thank you, Shalini. Um, Steve. Um... Hi, 
Yeah, so I, I was the part that I, I like the healthy and effective. I think that works well. So the training part, there is no training like being on the actual planning board. So I've been to all the training. There's a thing called the Citizen Planning Training Collaborative CPTC, and they do training for all the Massachusetts planning board. And I've been to all of their sessions. I even taught a course from them once. It's all theoretical. So there's no, there's nothing that, that will ever substitute for actual practice. So it really needs to be both of those. But in a way, what Sarah, the one way to solve this is the associate member. So that was, that's in the parking lot. That should there be associate members to the planning board, but that's the perfect sort of internship for planning is, is that associate membership category, which we don't have. A discussion for another time. So I'm going to leave this comment that we need to come back to the term limits thing. I, to summarize, I think I've heard at least two, maybe three members thinking about wanting to delete the paragraph completely. Um, I think that's what I've heard right now. We're not going to vote on that right now. We can mull things over. Members can think about things. Uh, we can think about what Dave said about some other things. Um, we will come back to it at a later meeting. I am curious whether anyone has any issue with anything in B um, at this time. And then we will move on. Um, raise your hand if you do, um, or whether you'd want changes to that. Um, what the plan is for this is we will continue working our way through at the next meeting. Um, we will not come back to the term limits thing at the very beginning of the next meeting. I want to push our way through the rest of things and see where our um, where our agreements are in getting to consensus for this plan um, and this process and where any requests for potential changes might lie um, so that we can start planning. We might be able to start moving ahead with appointments to planning board while we still work out later parts of the process, if that makes sense. Um, I do encourage um, everyone to continue. I know this is new for Shalini, myself and Steve. It is not new for Evan and Sarah. We need to work on finding a sufficient applicant pool. One of the first steps that of the three that were sort of there, um, Evan, I, I want to confirm number one is technically continued and complete in terms of posting on the bulletin board at this time. Yeah, so um, it was posted to the bulletin board. I don't have the exact date in front of me, but it was um, posted sometime in April. That doesn't mean it wouldn't be useful potentially to repost. Okay. Uh, certainly with when we did ZBA, we posted at least twice, um, but also recognizing that the posting on the bulletin board uh, typically yields us zero ca candidates. It's, uh, believe it or not, the public is not flocking to the bulletin board to see what's up. Um, okay, I just wanted to confirm, CAF, we don't have to do anything with it this time. Um, I, I would, things are being passed and all, but we, we can start moving forward. I would encourage all committee members to continue reaching out and trying to recruit or find people to apply and fill out a CAF um, as we go forward with this process. I will actually put, in addition to discussion of the process, discussion of where we are on the actual appointments at our next meeting so that we can discuss, do we want another bulletin board posting where the CAFs stand, things like that, um, so that this committee um, can, especially Shalini, myself, and Steve, can be brought into where that stands and potentially why um, or reasons that um, OCA would not and could not declare the pool sufficient. Um, so I will make sure that is on our next agenda. And we will, as I said, continue working through the rest of this process to see um, what where, where potential changes or not are sought or not, um, and how much agreement we might have for this to try and get it adopted as soon as we can. Uh, I'm gonna stop the share for now. Um, we have, mm, let me look at my agenda. Um, 
So next meeting, more process. I'm sure Evan and Sarah are thrilled at that con <laughs> at, at that concept. But um, at this time, we have minutes. I at this point, I believe only have the May 19th minutes. Um, I haven't myself gone and figured out what's going on with the other two. So that's me. Um, I, I haven't even paid attention to whether I got them or not, um, or where they might be in existence in terms of stuff. So I fell through on that, but we have the May 19th minutes to adopt. Um, I believe I have, um, let me pull up the minutes. Um, I had some recommended changes to them, I believe. Um, so let me pull them up and go through my requested changes um, very quickly before we can adjourn here. Um, let me find out what they were. Did I pull up the wrong document? Oh, look at this. Um, it looks like there might only be one for me, which is very minor. It was a misspelling of a word. Um, should it was show act as agent of the council instead of should act as agent of the council. Um, so it was just a, a misspelling that spell check could not find. Um, that was my only requested change to the May 19th minutes. I put it on the agenda wrong, apparently, um, as May 18th. Any other requested changes to these minutes? Seeing none, I will myself make the motion to adopt the May 19 minutes as amended. Um, so I'm making that motion. Is there a second? Second. Shalini seconds it. All those in favor to, oops, I can't take, got to do roll call. <laughs> I will start with myself. Um, Mandy is a yes. Uh, Evan? Yes. Uh, Steve? Yes. Uh, Sarah? Yes. And Shalini? Yes. That is an unanimous adoption. We will move the B and C to the next meeting. My only announcement is um, that we have a meeting tomorrow night. I want to thank you all for working through five meetings in about 15 days. Um, <laughs> this one will begin, will <coughs> operate similar to the last one, but it is a normal planning board meeting night. So they actually have a much more extensive agenda than just this hearing. Last, last week, it was just the hearing in general for both of us. They added one thing in really quick at the beginning. So they'll, they'll call to order, they'll do their minutes, then I'll call to order. Then we'll go into the hearing. We'll go into the joint hearing. The goal is to, after that hearing hopefully closes, um, to, to vote a recommendation. Um, both wait for planning board if they're ready to vote a recommendation. If they vote one, if we're ready to vote after that, we would, we would vote that night so we don't have to bring it back to the next meeting and we can be done with that, that amendment potentially. So, so be ready for a potential motion and vote after hearing that would only I would only ask for that if we're ready only if planning board also makes a vote that night on a recommendation um, our goal is always to not vote before we hear the planning board recommendation um, mm -hmm. so that is the plan any questions about announcements or future agenda items or anything else at this time mm -hmm. no I do think we have we're trying to get some of the Wild Animal Act people back for the meeting in two weeks, right, Shalini? We don't have confirmation that they're available yet, though, right? Oh, right. Yeah. So I'll if they are, with them this week. we'll probably try to fit that in um, for no more than an hour, maybe even a but, little less. Oh, do we want them yet, or do we want to focus on this thing? That that is a question. Um, mm. Should we spend all of our meeting next week on? this. I'm seeing a nod from Evan. Do we want to try and add wild animal into it or should we push them off for another two weeks or so? Push them off. You, you can take it from Sarah and I, the process is going to take the whole meeting. Okay. <laughs> yeah, let's do the whole. Right, right. <laughs> Just going to be yeah, let's focus on that. And, so and if it's get done I, I will, early, yeah, to us. We deserve yeah, a little extra time. I will then ask time. Shalini um, to contact the Wild Animal Act mm -hmm. folks and see if they're available in mid-July to late July, one of those meetings. Um, and, and, you know, we'll, if we have to put anything else on the next meeting that is 
referred to us for some reason that's important, we'll add that in. Um, otherwise, mm -hmm. we'll focus on process and planning board to get mm -hmm. plans going and see if we can meet our 60-day deadline on that one, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is going to be tough. So thank you all. Um, sorry for running a little bit over. Uh, any other items or announcements or anything? Not seeing any. We're adjourned at 4 8 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thank you.